Hey family, good morning, good afternoon to you, good evening. Y'all know I'm trying to pump these videos out because I miss you family. Haven't been around in a minute and I think I need to um, uh, uh, reconnect. And so I'm going to get working for you today and bring y'all some, hopefully, some uh, um, uh, uh, mental health information and also situations that uh, let us know we're in the right place. So I'm going to do a little housekeeping first. But I'm, for those of y'all who have followed the lower link, um, uh, please donate to the Cash App. Continue to donate. Continue to support the channel in any way that you uh can and see fit to I really appreciate it and it is appreciated so um, um, I also want to give a shout out I want to give a shout out to uh, Truth Be Spoken um, also uh, and, uh, my truth speaker who is my uh, agent for my detox tea and I was hoping that I would be able to get uh, them on uh, last year uh, for an interview and um, so we'll see about this year if we'll be able to get them on or just do a conversation uh, about the product y'all been asking me um, what is it that I take that you know has gotten me looking a little different and I think it's uh, Tava Lava I really do so um, to uh, uh, shout out also to uh, Janice Rich um, of Cell Breast Enterprises. I want to thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. The channel show appreciates it. And for those of y'all who um, have donated, uh, uh, I do want to give you a shout out. Except the ones that y'all did, y'all didn't want that. And I, you know, I thank you. Uh, you want to remain anonymous, that's well and fine too. But I would like to shout out those of y'all who have donated to the channel. Because every little bit helps. And my goal is to um, bring in some more interviews um, this year. And to uh, 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 give you some behind the scene footage. Uh, whether it's in the studio or whether it's um, and making music. Uh, scores for movies, things of that nature. I think I'm going to add a lot of that to the uh, uh, um, upcoming year. Okay? So, thank y'all very much. And I want to get to this next story. Okay, you guys. A lot of y'all not going to remember this guy. I think I came in right pretty much uh, he was a bench player or the end of his career. I don't know if I remember him so much. Maybe the name, maybe he had just retired. I don't know. But anyway, Celtics legend and 10-time NBA champion Sam Jones died from natural causes at the age of 88. Uh, he's a Hall of Famer known as Mr. Clutch. Um, he was also remembered as a great player, as an upbeat person. You know, he was this, uh, damn, he played well. No, I don't remember because, see, I was a kid. I was a small, I remember the name because basketball was always in my house, I guess. Um, Sam Jones, the sharpshooting Boston Celtic guard, who, uh, won 10-time NBA titles along with Bill Russell before being inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, has died at 88. Just hearing from Aubrey Jones that his dad, Sam, passed away last night at 88, John Feinstein, a longtime uh, friend, uh, I mean, Washington Post contributor who interviewed Jones for a recent book tweet, uh, Sam, I just learned. Sam was a great NBA player, part of the 10 Celtics title team, an upbeat, enthusiastic person who played golf, well into his 80s. That kept him sharp. He also, um, he was a huge help to me on raise a fist, take a knee. Sad day. Yeah. The cause of death has not been revealed publicly, but a team spokesman said he died of natural causes. Um, the Celtics. 
have held a moment of silence. Um, for Jones before Friday's matinee game against the Phoenix Suns in Boston. You look at the championships and what he did is obviously a big loss for the community here. Uh, uh, Coach Emmy Udoka uh, told reporters on Friday. Is that the guy that's married to Nia Long? Yeah. Sam Jones was the most talented, versatile, and clutch shooters for the most successful and dominant team in the NBA history. Um, the Celtics said in their statement, his scoring ability, he was, was so prolific. And his form so pure that he earned a simple nickname, the Shooter. The Jones family is in our thoughts as we mourn the loss and finally remember the life and career of one of the greatest champions of American sports. Jones was a, Jones's 10 NBA titles as a player ranks second in the league behind only Russell, who won 11. Sam Jones. He played with... Um, KC uh, Jones, but they're not related. So, yeah, he played on that team with Havlicek, Bill Russell, um, Tom Sanders. So that must have been, the, what, the early 60s, mid-60s? Yeah, they probably, I think that's probably the mid-60s because I was, um, I remember those names. And some of these guys I did get a chance to see, like, I don't remember Bill Russell playing. I remember him being a coach. I remember Havlicek playing. I think he played, you know, in the 70s, up until like 75, 76. So I remember him playing, actually. Can't say the same for Sam Jones. However, my condolences go to his family. Mr. Clutch, he was the third member of the Celtics dynasty to pass away in the last two years. Uh, following his back part, uh, court partner K.C. Jones and Tommy Heinsohn. I didn't even know Tommy Heinsohn died. Both who died in 2020. Tommy Heinsohn was something else. He's another one. He was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, 1933, the same year my pop was born. Um, who y'all know passed away uh, in July. Oh, gosh. He was born in 1933. I haven't been able to speak about him yet uh, to y'all. But I have done some videos about my relationship with my father that uh, be on Patreon. So there's still some healing that needs to take place in that relationship. But God is good. So good. Sam Jones attended Larnberg Institute, a preparatory school founded at the request of civil rights hero Booker T. Washington. He go on to start at a little-known North Carolina college in Durham, now North Carolina Central, and was picked by legendary Celtics coach Red Auerbach with the eighth pick of the 1957 draft. Yes, see, I wasn't even born yet. In fact, Auerbach had never seen Jones play in college, usually a non-starter for the Hall of Fame coach. Initially, Jones didn't think he had a chance of cracking Jones' rotation, which included 11 veterans at the time. I never felt so miserable in my life when I got the news, Jones said at the time. I really thought it was the end of my basketball career. Sure, I was thrilled to be with the honor. I never thought I'd be able to break into the game, let alone into the starting lineup. Fortunately for Jones, he was wrong. After playing sparingly as a rookie, Jones replaced Bill Sherman in the Celtics' starting lineup in his second season and remained the franchise cornerstone throughout the 60s. With Russell Manning in, in the middle and perhaps the greatest defensive player in the NBA history, the Celtics needed offense, specifically shooting, and James Jones seemed to fill that role easily. Decades before the league adopted the three-point shot, Jones became one of the NBA's premier, preeminent premier shooters, hitting 45.6% of the field goals and 80.3% of his free throws while averaging 17 points a game over his entire career. 
He's known for making, for banking in his perimeter attempts off the backboard, which is a skill that is uh, now uncommon in the NBA. Well, the banks are open in heaven. This at <laughs> New York City tweeted former Celtic forward and radio announcer Cedric Maxwell. The bank is open. Jones is also known for his worth ethic. He'll do anything you ask him, our back said in the 60s and was quoted um, by NBA.com. He's always in shape, always ready to play, and nobody works any harder at basketball than he does. The Celtics had already won the title in 1957 before Jones' arrival the following season, but the team reeled off a record eight consecutive championships from 1959 until 1966. I said the mid sixties, huh? With the six foot four point guard as one of their key players. Then when Russell as the team's player coach, Boston would win two more titles in 1968-1969. Now that's when I, re I I can remember those games. I was a kid, but I can remember those games. Okay? I was maybe nine, eight. Um in the the last of which came in Jones's final season with the team. Jones is a five-time All-Star as a player, had a brief coaching career at his alma mater, and later served as an assistant for the New Orleans Jazz in 1974 and 1975. But he never had the same success that he had as a player. So he will go on to be inducted into the Nate Smith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in 1984 and was recently in. Uh, included in the 75 players named to the NBA's 75th anniversary team. Okay. Um, Jones was fortunate to play for one of the more progressive organizations in professional sports in the late 50s and early 60s. That's why it gets me when everybody, you know, uh, associate Boston with being a racist team. Because it was a white team, you know, and to some degree it's true. But, you know, Red Auerbach was a real, real uh, character. He was a renegade because he was putting black people on that team when nobody wanted them, you know, and he didn't care. So, you know, uh, people like that, they'd be like, can you stand it? If you can stand it, I want you. You know, because they know they alone can't change the way the world is. They alone are not responsible for, for the predicament the society is in. But they can do their best to do their part to change it. And that's what most progressive people do. You know, um, let's see. Later in 1966, Auerbach chose Russell as his hand-picked successor, making him the first African-American coach. Uh, in a major U.S. team sports. Russell also continued to play for the Celtics, I'm sorry, who would go on to win ten, two more titles before the end of the decade. It said, but despite the Celtics' progressive attitude towards race, the city of Boston and the NBA were less accommodating to black athletes at the time. In a November article for the Associated Press, Jones remembered the NBA landscape in the 60s only being marginally different from what he had experienced growing up in America's segregated South. There was a quota for blacks when I came in 1957. There were only two players on each team that were African American, recalled Jones. The 1960s, of course, we know that, you guys. We already know that Auerbach and all these guys, I mean, given their own personal belief, you know, I'm sure they were, you know, nigger this and nigger that. You, know, you, can, you can imagine. Just use your imagination, okay? Um, but there was a quota, in other words. Um, this guy says, and that's Sam. These are the Sam Jones' own, own words, Okay? There was a quota for blacks when I came in 1957. There were only two players on each team that were African-Americans. In the 1960s, 
was a decade. Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points, and the Celtics Lakers rivalry took flight in the NBA's second dynasty reign on the Boston parquet floor. It was also a time of ongoing struggle and a crisis across America when this country was forever alerted on a bloody Sunday. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of his dream and black athletes raised their fists and voices in hopes of holding on, holding, of holding America to its creed. In his infancy, just 10 years prior, the NBA took its first meaningful strides in the 1960s, growing from a little league that could barely get attention to laying the framework it still stands on today, a place where athletes can be more entertained can be more than entertainment and use their influential platform to effect change. George Mikan and the Lakers run of championships in the 50s had provided the buzz around the NBA. Boston then followed with eight consecutive titles, part of 11 in 13 years by the Hall of Famer Bill Russell. The kind of on-the-court dominance and for the young lead had never seen before. See, he never seen nothing like that. Still, the games were barely being broadcast on television. This was the 60s. Y'all got to remember that. This was the 60s. And the titles, is, you know, didn't come with the fanfare and the afterthoughts as they do today. Y'all got to remember, some of y'all who didn't have to face all that and you just look at it now and think it's always been that way. Oscar Robinson talks of the days of opening up his locker and black cat. Somebody put a black cat in there and a black cat comes out. It was rough. Just like singing. Being on them buses, having to pee and having to go out on the side of the bus in a cup because nobody wanted you to, you know, come in and uh, they white establishment. But in spite of that, you know, they played ball and did what they had to do. You know? It's, it's interesting. Um, still, the games were barely being broadcast. That's that's crazy. Um, we never flew first class in my first 12 years of playing. And on-course success certainly didn't shield the league's black players from the reality that existed off the court as activists challenged Jim Crow's grip of the South and Vietnam War and was becoming increasingly a flashpoint. Players who spoke out risked everything, just like today. What we did, we kind of did behind the scenes as best as we could because a lot of us were insecure at the time because we there weren't that many of us to begin with, said Wayne Embry, who played 11 seasons in the NBA and was on the Celtics' 1968 championship team before becoming the league's first black general manager in 1972. And I do know Wayne Embry. He was the uh, general manager for the Milwaukee Bucks. And I met him uh, a lot of times in my youth and did a lot of um, singing at events that he had as a uh, young person. So... Rest in peace to Brother Rain Embry. Um, and we loved him here in Milwaukee. Uh, he said that uh, when you were on non-guaranteed contracts and management didn't like what you did, you were just gone. That awareness was common thread among players that challenged the status quo. Sacrifice is what strongly characterizes an activist, said uh, Lynn Elmore, who played 10 seasons in the NBA and is a senior lecturer at Columbia University where he's taught on athlete activism and social justice in sports. Back in those days, those guys could not have only lost their positions, but would have been forgotten by history. Even star players on premier teams weren't immune from indignities of racism. You know, uh, some people say, I, I wouldn't have took that, I wouldn't have did this, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, I would Listen. If you're smart enough, you'll take it because you'll turn that platform into something more powerful. And um, nobody said it was going to be easy. And sometimes that's a sacrifice you have to make, the hurt that you have to take.
And we have to always be aware of the yin and the yang of every situation. There was a lot of places we couldn't eat, Jones said. If the hotel we were staying in was closed, we had to fly in a black section of town to get food late at night. Sometimes we just have to wait until the next morning to get some food. Jones said black players in Boston had a champion in our back. Our back was known for his demanding style. Jones described our back as taskmaster and said at times he overdid it, but... The coach also recognized how his players were affected by what was happening in the world. Jones remembered one example in 1961 when him, Casey, Sachs, Sander, and Russell refused to play in the exhibition game in Lexington, Kentucky. They refused to play. So I want y'all to hear that, uh, players of today. When the social issues got so bad, and they ain't make half the money y'all making. Half the money. They ain't even make a fraction. Jones remembered example when he, KC, Sat, Sandra, and Russell refused to play in the exhibition game in Lexington, Kentucky. The team was in his hotel when Sam Jones asked Sanders to go to the lobby and get some food, and they were refused service. And so I told Satch, I'm going home. And I said, I don't care what you do. I'm going home, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to play this damn game. I can't get nothing to eat. The duo went to the elevators where they were met by Russell and KC Jones. After Sam told them what had happened, Russell implored them to talk to Auerbach. Auerbach called the hotel manager who quickly relented and said he'd allow the players to eat in the restaurant, but that wasn't enough for Sam Jones. Once we eat in the hotel, blacks will never eat down here again until something happens. So, I'm going home, he told Auerbach. And the rest of the fellas decided that they would go home too. And guess what? Red Auerbach was the one who took us to the airport. Jones credited Auerbach for supporting the players and others in his position were shying away from the racial issues in the city and complimented I mean, with a complicated history. Like I said, Red Auerbach, I, I respect him a lot. You know, you know, yeah, he did what he did for basketball. He went down, but he should. He went went down as a man that had uh, fair principles. Okay, while the Celtics and the Bruins broke the color barrier in their sports, the Red Sox were the last Major League Baseball team to field a black player in 1959. And a decade after the Supreme Court landmark Brown versus the Board of Education decision in 1954 declared schools separate by race to be unequal, Boston fought the segregation measures by a state legislature. It led to violent protests over court order bus busing in the 1970s. I was a part of that. I was bust. He knew. Uh, we were men, we were not children. You got to understand that the Celtics were the first to draft a black player. Celtics were the first to have a black coach. You got to remember that. The Celtics were the first to start five black players in the NBA. So there was a lot of things in this, that the Celtics did that were actually first um, for African Americans. And we really can't forget that. Uh, a lot of that. A lot of that. Was um, predicated by the work of Auerbach. And you can't take that away from him. So rest in peace Mr. Sam Jones. My condolences go to your family. You was a great guard. You played for the Boston Celtics. It's amazing. You know, as a young man, and now you you, you you crossed over, made your transition with the ancestors at 88 years old. Years, um, and 88 years is a long time. So God be with you. And um, I'll see you guys in the uh, next video.